Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you again, in, in the case of some of you, uh, on behalf of Queen's University Belfast and the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics, uh, to the first in the 59th series of Wiles Lectures in the History of Civilization. The Wiles Lectures were founded in 1953 by the late Mrs. Austin Boyd of Craig of Ad County Down in memory of her father, Thomas S. Wiles of Albany, New York. Acting with the advice of the then Vice Chancellor of Queen's, Sir, er Sir Eric Ashby, uh, and of Sir Herbert Butterfield, who was then Master of Peterhouse, Cambridge, of whose writings she was a great admirer, Mrs. Boyd generously endowed a trust fund to support an annual series of lectures to promote the study of the history of civilization and to encourage the extension of historical thinking into the realm of general ideas. The fund would bring to Belfast each year an expert in a particular field of historical scholarship to deliver four lectures on successive days related to the lecturer's research and reflecting on the wider implications of their research for historical understanding. The first lectures were delivered in 1953 by Herbert Butterfield and published subsequently as Man on His Past. Mrs Boyd was indefat indefatigable in her attendance at the lectures and since her death, <coughs> members of her family have carried on this tradition and have been equally assiduous in supporting not only the, the lectures but the other activities of the Trust. Unfortunately, Mrs Heather Boyd, who along with her late husband Trevor has been a valued supporter of the Wiles Trust over many years, is unable to be with us this year due to illness and we wish her well uh, as she recovers in hospital. And we welcome me uh, members of the Boyd family uh, who have been able uh, to come to attend uh, uh, this year's lectures and we ask them to pass on our best wishes to, to Heather uh, in hospital. Now, before I introduce this year's speakers, speaker, I have uh, several announcements to make. The first is the, the regular one on the advice of the university's fire officer in the case uh, of uh, a fire emergency. The emergency exits are our two doors at the back of the lecture theatre and an emergency door here at the front. And could I request you to turn off or turn to silent your mobile phones if you haven't already done so? For those of you who haven't attended uh, the Wilds lectures before, I should advise you that it's, it is not the custom uh, in the series for there to be a formal question and answer session after the lecture. Uh, there is an opportunity for the speaker to discuss the lecture with their invited guests later on in the evening. However, for those of you who would like to ask a question or to raise a point with the lecturer, there w uh, before each of the succeeding lectures, uh, on Thursday and Friday afternoon uh, at 5 p.m. in this lecture theatre uh, and the final one on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. in this lecture theatre. Tea and coffee will be served uh, in the cloisters of the quadrangle just uh, near the entrance to the Great Hall uh, from 4.30 tomorrow and Friday and at 10.30 uh, on Saturday, Saturday morning. So you have, you have an opportunity to, to have a discussion with Mary, if she's happy to talk to you, which I'm sure she will be, uh, at tea before the, 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 uh, the succeeding lectures. Um, so it's with great pleasure that um, I now introduce our 2017 uh, Wiles lecturer. Mary Rubin has been since 2000 the Professor of Medieval and Early Modern History at Queen Mary University of London. She holds degrees from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and from the University of Cambridge, where she also held a research fellowship at Girton College, followed by a university lectureship and readership in Oxford uh, with a fellowship at Pembroke College. She's held visiting positions at a number of universities across the world, including the University of North Carolina, New York University, uh, and the Central European University in Budapest. Uh, Professor Rubin is a, a, an extremely distinguished scholar of European history with, a wide, with wide research interests ranging across the period between 1100 and 1600, exploring, the themes, uh, uh, exploring many themes in the religious culture of Europe. Her work has sought to understand the message of Christian charity as practiced in medieval communities, to explore the meanings of the arch sacrament, the Eucharist, to explore new narratives about Jews which turned into public social dramas, and through all her publications, she has sought to address issues of identity, community and gender, the boundaries of cooperation and the threat of violence. Her many books include Charity and Community in Medieval Cambridge, 1987, Corpus Christi, the Eucharist in Late Medieval Culture in 1991, Gentile Tales, the Narrative Assault on Late Medieval Jews, 1999, The Hollow Crown, A History of Britain in the Later Middle Ages, 2005, 
Mother of God, A History of the Virgin Mary in 2009, uh, and A Very Short Introduction to the Middle Ages, published in the <coughs> Oxford University Press Short Introduction Series in 2014. Um, and she's also, uh, as a kind of uh, a, a consequence of her work on uh, the cult of the Virgin Mary, uh, very recently edited uh, an edition of The Life and Passion of William of Norwich, a 12th century Latin hagiographical text which contains, contains the first known accusations of child murder brought against the, the Jews of Norwich, which was published in, in 2014. Mary Rubin is a, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a member and former president of the London Medieval Society, <coughs> counsellor of the Medieval Academy of America, and on the editorial board of, a, of, of a, a large number of book series and scholarly journals, including the Journal of Medieval History. She also has a very strong commitment to bringing medieval history out of the academy and into the, uh, the public domain, making regular contributions to BBC radio series, such as In Our Time and The Long View, and contributing to documentaries broadcast on, on BBC radio and television and by broadcasters in Europe and Canada. She has produced podcasts, written theatre notes, and advised on museum exhibitions most recently for the Blood Exhibition at the Jewish Museum in London. So it's a tremendous honour and pleasure for us to have Mary here in Belfast as our 2017 Wiles Lecturer. So I'd like you now to welcome Professor Mary Rubin as she delivers the Wiles Lectures on the subject of Strangers into Neighbours, Dealing with Diversity in Medieval European Cities, beginning this afternoon with her first lecture, which is Thinking the City, Thinking the Stranger. Mary, thank you very much. I was invited to deliver the Wiles Lectures in the summer of 2015 as Europe witnessed the uh, worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. And since delivering these lectures is such an honour and a challenge, I accepted. I knew that the Wiles Lectures were not like other learned academic series. Thomas S. Wiles's relatives founded the lectures in 1953, as you heard, with the aim of creating an occasion to encourage the extension of historical thinking into the realm of general ideas. One can appreciate in the midst of the Cold War the desire of members of this transatlantic family, the Wilde family, represented then by Mrs. Austin Boyd of Cortina, Craig Avid, to promote a beneficial transfer of historical ideas to a wide and diverse audience. This aim has been achieved not only through the lectures themselves, which have been splendid events, uh, and I'm sure they'll be this year as well, by all accounts. Uh, they, they're, they're very stimulating, and, uh, and of course, they so effectively have been uh, organized by generations of Queen's historians and administrators. But the Wiles Lectures uh, also have produced books with uh, Cambridge University Press, some much-loved and well-known books like here. The opportunity to enrich our public conversations with insights gleaned from historical research and reflection is perhaps more precious than ever before. As I contemplated my own contribution, the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany was welcoming the miserable and dispossessed of, of, of Syria's civil war. No historian, not least a Jewish one, could fail to be moved by signs like this. I wondered how these people will make their homes in Europe and how Europeans may support their efforts or hinder them. For hundreds of thousands of people will be transformed from strangers into neighbors. Like so many Irish immigrants over the generations, probably parents will make sacrifices so that their children can live better, different lives, becoming citizens in the cities and states which are their new homes. All this made me think about Europe of centuries ago, a time of vigorous migration, of buoyant economic change, but also of war, exile and disease. How did the communities of Europe between, say, 1000 and 1500 think about the making of strangers into neighbours? How did they confront the risks and the benefits, the moral imperatives and the social consequences of allowing newcomers into the settlements they called home? This is surely worth knowing. We look into the past not expecting for it to be repeating itself, but for the broadening of our own sense of the possible. Such an engagement with the past teaches us humility, for we will also recognize much of ourselves in those communities of long ago. How do our solutions to similar problems compare to theirs? 
So I've turned to a terrain I know fairly well, that is Europe and its cities, and posed a question to which I did not have the full answer. How did European cities treat those considered to be strangers? As we shall see, strangers, um, strangers included immigrants from villages or small towns nearby in proximity to a city, those who provided the working hands required in workshops and homes. But they also included immigrants from further afield with distinctive languages and occupations which were reinforced by a constant flow of immigration like the Tuscans in Venice or the Flemings in London. And there were also those who may have lived in a city for generations but were still treated as strangers. <coughs> Muslims, Jews, Armenians, Greeks. Alongside these groups there was a constant stream of passers through traders in the market, pilgrims, students, each with their own distinctive contribution to city life and its diversity. So let us begin with a reminder of how European cities actually became places where newcomers sought to make a home. There is no single history of Europe's towns and cities. Some were urban centers of uh, the Roman world, civitates, uh, centers for administration, where imperial law held sway, as did manufacture and commerce, rich with public life and entertainment offered in stadia and hippodromes. When the empire made Christianity first licit and then its official religion in the course of the 5th century, cities became also centers for church administration, under bishops who presided authoritatively from their episcopal sees, such cities were most densely located in southern Europe, but they reached as far as Cologne and Trier in the north. In them, bishops assumed authority and responsibilities far beyond just what we would consider the religious domain. They were keepers of the peace, they supervised the city's water and food supplies, they managed charitable distributions and maintained schools too. In the 5th and 6th centuries, the Western Empire gave way to a set of um, kingdoms of Ostrogoths and Visigoths and Franks and Burgundians and Vandals. And in the 7th century, of course, the Mediterranean was reordered by the Muslim conquest and the establishment of the Caliphate in North Africa and parts of Southern Europe and Mediterranean Europe. Yet cities remained centers of resilience to which refugees often fled for safety. When in the later 8th and 9th centuries, northern settlers, Vikings as they're known, disrupted the regions of northwest Europe, they incorporated cities and ports into their spheres of trade, promoting centers like Dublin and York. And during these centuries, cities developed as administrative and religious centers, as pilgrimage destinations, and as dynastic bases of operation. Some cities were literally made afresh, seats for ambitious new dynasties like Ravenna of the Ostrogoths or Aachen of the Carolingians. Such cities required food, services and manufactured goods. They always generated demand and stimulated commercial activity. There was notable growth of trade in the 9th and 10th centuries, often at sites of former Roman forts and bends and rivers, places where exchange of agricultural produce and some manufactured goods, pottery, armor, took place in relative safety. This urban life, var varied and patchy, existed on the basis of customs and in the negotiation of rights between inhabitants of these urban-like centers and those who held authority over the locality, a monastery, a bishop, uh, an aristocratic family, a count, a king. Around the year 1000, a complex coming together of demographic, technological and political processes prompted the developments which over the next 300 years saw the expansion of the size of Europe's population probably threefold, the growth in areas of settlement, in the amount of food produced and in the scope of pace of exchange and urban life. The number and geographical spread of Europeans living some sort of Christian life also grew to include people in Scandinavia, in the kingdoms of Poland and Hungary, and in those lands of Iberia soon to be conquered from Muslim rulers. The economic stimulus was felt earliest in the south and in the northwest of Europe, and it was experienced by millions of peasants in their daily lives, some of whom chose to be involved in town life and commerce. Early medieval towns and cities were joined now by hundreds of new settlements of every size all over Europe. <coughs> all over Europe, but not everywhere equally. 
for the legacy and placement and climate and agrarian regimes and natural endowments of settlements and as importantly the political capacity of rulers to stimulate economic change varied across the continent. While urban creation was alive, say, in the extraordinarily vivacious area of Lotharingia in the 10th century, that's the bright green area there, it only emerged in Bohemia and Poland in the 12th. When the encyclopedic scholar, the Franciscan uh, Bar Bartholomew the English, surveyed cities in Europe and beyond in the early 13th century, he mentioned no cities in Iceland, Finland, the Baltic, Norway, Sweden and Hungary. And in Bohemia, he only knew one, Prague. This was nothing less than an urban transformation of Europe. In some regions, close to 30% of inhabitants lived urban lives in settlements where trade and manufacture set the tone, where a variety of religious and educational institutions offered their services, and where, wall gave protection, where walls gave protection. Such walls also mark the places of entry and of fiscal control. They enclosed the space where townspeople interacted in administration and in trade, within which could take place governance in promotion of economic life, safety and sociability. All these activities were based on principles of inclusion and exclusion. The urban groups which coalesce to negotiate rights for their communities, for these urban communities, were those who already enjoyed connections, be they with landed families of the region or with a local bishop. And they were the first to emerge as sworn association uh, in, in, in the later 11th century. In, say, Le Mans in 1070, Combray 1077, Beauvais 1099. And by the 12th century, these are more than, than sworn associations. These are groupings that have their own officials uh, um, with, with tasks to do and in delivering, um, in delivering urban life. In such urban centers were created some of the institutions and forms of living which we still most cherished, the, the craft guilds and their protection of members, the political assemblies and participatory governance in sort of local councils, the architecture to match squares and city halls, universities as centers for critical thinking. But in these urban institutions were also enshrined precepts and prejudices, some of which we are still working to remove, like the exclusion of women from civic authority. All that was new in towns depended on a diversity of talents and endowments, on lawyers and notaries, merchants and bankers, doctors and teachers, on artisans and tens of crafts, on priests and actors and street vendors. The history we are about to encounter saw in the period of economic growth, as need dictated, imaginative openness to those who could provide much needed services and skills. And so we see Genoese shipmakers welcome to 12th century Seville, Italian and Jewish financiers to 13th century Hungarian cities, Flemish weavers in 14th century England, and Saxon miners in 15th century Tuscany. The resulting diversity varied according to region, and it changed over time. It was always a challenge to those who governed, to those who lived alongside newcomers, and to the strangers themselves as they embarked on new lives. How did urban communities achieve this feat of civic organization? Well, they had at their disposal some useful resources. One was Roman law, the legacy of the Roman Empire, where citizenship was granted to all free male inhabitants in the year 212. Roman law developed a sustained discussion of citizenship and its limits, and after the empire became a Christian polity, always the, also discussed the place of non-Christians in that polity. Roman law was the organizing principle for life in towns of the old Roman provinces, even after the fall of imperial rule, especially in Iberia, Occitania and Italy. As we shall see in tomorrow's lecture, new and evolving urban communities gained autonomy and nowhere more prominently than in the Low Countries, the Midi, and Central and Northern Italy. This allowed them to legislate, to create and enforce statutes with the aim of enabling trade and promoting safety. 
Such statutes will tell us a great deal about how cities sought to treat strangers, to allow some of them to become neighbours, and some even fellow citizens. Medium-sized towns of a few thousands and large ones, cities of tens of thousands of inhabitants, also benefited from the cosmopolitan habits of some of European's elite groups. So there was, of course, the ubiquitous network of Latin learning, uh, possessed and promoted by church institutions above all. But there were other types of lingua franca which facilitated the spread of ideas about city life and civic culture across regions. That arc of comprehensibility, if I can call it that, which stretched from, uh, say, Catalonia to the Piedmont, allowed, um, allowed business contacts to develop with greater ease, say, for Tuscan bankers uh, moving through the region. Uh, furthermore, a type of sort of Franco-Italian was the lingua franca um, which developed in 13th and 14th century Italy, the sort of language that Marco Polo actually um, used when he wrote his uh, the account of his travels, Le Divisement du Monde, uh, which was later had to be translated into Tuscan. From the 13th century, a civic culture in Low German <coughs> prevailed throughout Northern, Baltic, and Central Europe. In all these languages, the heritage of classical, economic, legal, and political theory combined with local usages and the aspirations of urban leaders into discussions of the urban common good, the bonum comune. Urban writers, often holders of important offices and deeply involved in politics like Dante or Chaucer, reflected on how cities should be governed and how their members might live as moral communities. These reflections were ideologically charged for so many claimed to be the true protectors of that common good. Local town councils, craft guilds, princes, even kings had visions, all had visions of their stewardship of that common good in cities. Those who theorized urban life believed that townspeople shared more than mere contiguity, that their coming together could be a rational and hence a moral act. The Florentine notary, scholar, and politician Brunetto Latini, who died in 1294, channeled Aristotle in his Il Tesoro, later translated across Europe as a sort of phenomenal uh, encyclopedic work. And he claimed that a city is a gathering of people made to live according to reason. And hence, these people are not citizens of the same commune because they are gathered together within one wall, but rather because they're gathered together to live in reason. Such reason was implicit in the elections of officials and explicit in the statutes and rituals um, meant to promote the liberty, the libertas, freedom of action, freedom to legislate, which since the 12th century animated makers of urban communities. A few de decades after Latini, the German jurist Nicolaus Wurm, educated in Bologna, set out his digest on urban laws for Silesian towns in the form of a dialogue between one Menius and one Gaius. And there too, he asks, why should one call something a city and which should one call or what should one call a city? And the answer is, it's called the city because the people therein should live peacefully in a union and keep the laws. And then he refers to Roman law. And then a bit later, what is the general or common good? I ask this. The common good is that good which no one should pull asunder. Reason was meant to govern human relations within a landscape, a distinctive environment. As towns develop their self-governing instruments, urban statutes, and lay down their priorities in areas of concern, they often address the treatment of animals, of plants and trees and water, both within the city and in its immediate surroundings. And a rich vein in current scholarship, scholarship eco-criticism, is teaching and urging us that the understanding of the urban is really, to understand the urban is also to appreciate the natural and the manufactured aspects of city life. Water, shelter, access to space for work and recreation all affected the sense of place and identity of town dwellers and this in turn influenced their attitudes to those who might come to share these resources with them. Hence, the best way perhaps 
to gauge uh, Siena's early environment, and this is an idea that was planted in my mind by Mario Ascari, is to, to look at Siena's early urban development then is to, uh, which in the period before its plenteous and systematic, uh, um, its systematic archives uh, were in existence, is to really appreciate its ability to dig things like this. It's Bottini, the subterranean system of water supply, so carefully managed by generations of urban officials. Similarly, towns paid attention to waste management, paving of roads, control of livestock, regulation of access to light, and all these intersected with the categories of belonging and strangerhood. In Siena, for example, access to water for industrial use, for fulling and dyeing and tanning, was regulated through guilds, and this, of course, meant access to members and citizen only. Running the city meant making it a good place to work, to live safely and healthily. As theorists considered how a city might be managed, as we've seen, artists imagined its appearance too. And in 1338-9, the Sienese artist, just at Siena, uh, the Sienese artist Ambrogio Lorenzetti attempted to capture what was at stake in the governance of that city. At the invitation of the city's rulers, the Nine, a form of republican government that prevailed from the 1280s to 1355, he painted the allegories of good and bad government in the room from which those very nine governed. Lorenzetti chose vantage points which have recently been reconstructed by local scholars uh, Brogi and Bianciardi, and uh, from the Piazza del Campo, therefore, one observes the city at peace with itself, at work with its roofers, its builders, its shoemakers, its teachers, its weavers, at study and at play. And all this was made possible thanks to the system of good government, which was just government and combined important virtues, the force of law delivered without fear and corruption. That's what happens under fear and corruption. The city enjoyed a regulated flow of food which arrived through its gates and securitas, securitas, security, safety, hovered over the verdant fields with her comforting words which are inscribed right there. Oh, that went all haywire on the screen, sorry about that. That without fear every free man walk and after laboring everyone throw the seed while this commune keeps this lady, Lady Securitas, in power, she who would deny the guilty any power. Go back to that because that's rather disorienting. Siena was one of several cities in northern central Italy to gain a great deal of autonomy in the 12th and 13th centuries within the framework of the Holy Roman Empire. Other regions saw similar communal achievements as we have noted in the county of Flanders, the county of Provence, each unfolded into larger kingdoms and political systems. But the degree of autonomy and thus the degree of deliberative rationality that cities could apply to their activities was different where dynastic rule was more imposing. So in Paris, for example, it became a capital city in the 12th century, directed from the Ile de la Cité for the king by a prévôt, a provost, on behalf uh, and, and who, who was the top administrator of the city on behalf of the crown. When there was a great need for credit in the growing city, though, a royal privilege was extended to bankers from the town of Asti in the Piedmont, problem solved. Conversely, Krakow, royal residence and cathedral city, received from the King of Poland in 1257 a charter of autonomy. Its self-government was managed by German merchants who had arrived by royal edict together with other enabling groups, such as Tuscan bankers and Jewish merchants. So, each city had a different level of agency in applying uh, its decisions and particularly on decisions of bringing in groups of strangers. Cities confronted strangers, ranging from the immigrant peasants to invited experts, with differing degrees of autonomy, hence with differing degrees of local consultation, what we might call local buy-in. Urban life depended above all on trust. Trust that food would be available in shops every day, that malefactors would be kept away from one's home, and that in the market business was conducted fairly. 
local merchants and artisans had to be trusted, as were the officials who supervised the quality of bread and beer, fish and meat. Feeding great cities was the work of hundreds of producers across vast regions, where, whose environments were thus shaped by the city's demand. Bruce Campbell's project on feeding London showed how uh, the capital's needs affected cropping and planting and husbandry decisions made on manors and farms throughout the southwest of England and deep into the Cotswolds and even Wales. And as James Davis, also in this room this evening, has recently suggested, such provisioning of the city was not just an economic exchange, it also offered people were potential migrants, a sort of glimpse into uh, uh, urban life, familiarity with the city, and a possible enticement to migrate there. Economic growth created opportunities and required labour. Some skilled could be learnt on farms and manors and transferred to urban centres, and the unskilled, of course, were required too in great numbers. There was also demand for rarer expertise. Lawyers, stonemasons, physicians and moneylenders. While cities needed to attract incomers, immigrants could make choices too. And this is why a city's reputation was so important. In Sefer Hasidim, an early 13th century work of precepts and exemplar for a rigorous Jewish life, Rabbi Yudah the Pious of Regensburg noted that Jews eventually adopted the ethical tone of the communities within which they lived. When Jews look around for a place in which to live, they should take stock of the residents of that town. How chaste are the Christians there? Know that if Jews live in that town, their children and grandchildren will also behave just as the Christians do. For in every town, Jews act just like the Christians there. But before such integration into urban communities was achieved, the stranger was called most commonly in our sources for insecus, Forensis, forestiere, forain, fremde, hospitus, which has more like a sort of guest spin to it, alienus, alien. And for those who were residents, more, more settled residents, uh, incoli, habitatores, moradores. Citizenship or freedom or franchise was the highest form of integration and it ensured a plenitude of political and economic rights and duties, of course, and was usually held only by a small part of many cities and by Christian men mostly. It was based on criteria of birth, ownership of property, or membership of a craft guild. Citizenship was often inherited by sons, though often they too had to pay in order to claim it and within a particular period of time. But other members of the family of the citizen stood to benefit too. In the 14th century, both, English and, both England and France developed a sophisticated system of naturalization, or denization as it's called in England, managed by royal officials. The poster for these lectures is adorned by an image of, um, by an image that's lovely, from uh, the late 13th century statutes of the city of Agen in southern France, which where we see that town's process of making the citizen uh, depicted, and it's, it's rather lovely, uh, but in fact what the text says is that um, such a person has to appear before, before the city's lord and consuls and forswear heresies, which is a big deal in the south of France in the uh, 13th century, promising to be available and answerable to any complaint against him. Additionally, within a year and a month, he will have brought property in Agen, a house or a vineyard or some other property according to his ability. He was also to use that time in order to resolve any outstanding duties that he owed to a lord outside the city. For many people this was probably the most common route into the city, a rural dweller offering his labour and setting up a home and a family. But urban diversity also resulted from domination and conquest as Rhys Davis named his 1988 Wiles Lectures in regions like Wales and Ireland and Livonia and Iberia throughout our period. In such parts, indigenous people formed substantial rural majorities and recognizable groups in urban centers too. Indeed, the whole swathe of Central Europe, from the Baltic to the Adriatic, 
practically, from Livonia through Poland and Hungary, eastwards to Ruthenia, sustained from the 12th century, from the later 12th century, arrangements which favored economic development in cities and towns run by German-speaking merchants and artisans from contiguous regions of the empire, from Saxony, Thuringia, Prussia. Kings offered attractive privileges which made these foreign merchants into the ruling caste of cities like Buda and Prague. The Teutonic Order did, order did the same in its Baltic sphere, developing cities like Reval and Riga and Dorpat. And in all of these cities, German law formed the legal framework and the language of politics and administration and ritual and exchange was low German. Indigenous uh, people, like the local lives in, in Riga, were kept out of guilds and out of politics, and so worked as servants and porters. How might we approach this multitude of experiences and the diversities it created? When historians and theorists have thought about medieval cities, they have tended to consider them in the period of growth and institution building. Those cities have been celebrated, after all, for over a century as the best of European heritage, islands of freedom in a feudal sea. In an important uh, recent article, Mark Bona, who's here with us, has shown us just what was at stake in the vision of Europe that the great medieval historian Henri Pirenne developed a century ago with the aid of his view of the European city. And at the very same time as he was toiling, just about, the medieval city served as a template for, this, for the system-building cogitations of Max Weber. His western, occidental city was distinctively modern, rational, a good thing. Weber imagined that medieval European city as free from the yoke of dynastic intrusion, which contrarywise he thought dominated the Asiatic city. As we have already mentioned, most medieval cities indeed lived under royal jurisdictions and closely supervised in England and France and Castile and Aragon and Poland and Hungary and Sicily and Portugal. Dynastic control was ever there to a meaningful degree in large regions of urban Europe. We also think of cities through the imagination of another great medieval historian, Jacques Le Goff who admired the freedom to think enjoyed by townspeople above all. He admitted once in an interview that his experience as a teenager in Vichy, France, had much to do with this, for he absolutely worshipped men like his uncle, urban workers who bravely resisted, while all he ever saw countrymen do was carry sides of bacon on the back of their bikes for sale in the black market. He encouraged us to study the city as a locus for critical and inventive thinking, like that which scholars in the University of Paris undertook in the 12th, from, from the 12th century, century on, and which contributed to urban flourishing as they asked and, and disputed, what is the just, just price? Should cities have brothels? Can alms be given from ill-gotten earnings? Urban questions dialectically pondered. Historians engage fruitfully with the past through question raised in the present. The best historical practice should shed light on the past rather than violate it. And one way we explore the past is by using terms we find useful as tools in that analysis, even tools unfamiliar in the language, in medieval usage. I follow here that wonderful ancient Greece, Greek historian, historian of ancient Greece, Nicolò Rho, in naming such a practice, controlled anachronism, anachronisme contrôlé. While I shall be sharing with you the wide range of terms used by the subjects of our inquiry through their texts, we may also use concepts and terms which help identify phenomena that are substantially similar or highly comparable to those in our own lives. While Jews were rarely described as foreign seki or alieni in medieval urban documents, it is useful for us to think of them among and in comparison with other strangers as forms of diversity. While they never explicitly speak of women as strangers, we will explore the range of disabilities which often made women's lives in cities quite similar to those of unenfranchised workers or recent immigrants. Working historically entails sensitivity towards the terms of the past lives and conversations, but historians can also know things and ask questions about the past, which contemporaries could never do. 
The movement of people and their insertion into communities as conquerors, guests, visitors, colonizers, administrators, soldiers of fortune, in the search of opportunity or of refuge, has animated a great deal of reflection from some of our wisest thinkers in geography, in economics, in philosophy, and of course in history too. The present has always animated their questions. They brought to their studies variously the optimism of those in search of new worlds and the sober knowledge of exclusion and the pain of uprooting. Oscar Hanlon's great classic, Uprooted, is a sombre assessment of the experience of 1951, I should say, uh, is a sombre assessment of the experience of immigration to 19th century America, the struggle to establish male honor in the new homeland, a world so different from the tough yet intimate villages of Sicily or Sweden or indeed Ireland. He opened up rooted with something of a motto, once I thought to write a history of immigrants in America. Then I discovered the immigrants were American history. I greatly sympathize with that insight, for I too have found that studying the treatment of strangers is an education in many interlocking spheres of ethics and economics, urban space and family relations, ideas and practices. Handlin's attempt is somewhat echoed, I think, in E. Annie Prue's 1996 novel, Accordion Crimes. This is a story of an accordion made in Sicily around 1800 and its movement with its immigrant owners across the United States, pawned, stolen, gifted by a Sicilian, a German, a Mexican, immigrants all, and up to the 1990s. This reminds us that however much the stranger hopes for reception, she or he always retains so much that is from the other place, like the music played on that accordion. The ideas I bring to bear upon medieval sources are thus varied, and I shall share them with you as we go along. I'm much influenced by the ethical turn in the humanities and social sciences of recent years, where we now consider relations face to face as constitutive not only of identity in a narrow sense, but of any possibility of human flourishing by hosting, sharing, extending. Emmanuel Levinas's words about the neighbor, I think, are inspiring. He had no other place, is not a talk to us, is uprooted, without a country, not an inhabitant, exposed to the cold and the heat of the seasons. To be reduced to having recourse to me is the homelessness or strangeness of the neighbor. It is incumbent upon me. I mean, the translation here is difficult. I think it's something like, this weighs upon me, or I am forced to do so. It's, it's a difficult translation, but I think we get the, the, the force of it. Such an understanding is also implicit, I think, in the much more sober words uh, uh, written, or straightforward words, uh, written in 1932 by Lord Atkin in his landmark case of Donoghue versus Stevenson, the touchstone of all tort law since then that one must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions that could reasonably be foreseen as likely to injure one's neighbor. A neighbor was identified as someone who was so closely and directly affected by the act that one ought to have them in contemplation as being so affected when directing one's mind to the acts or omissions in question. It was indeed in the like legal and administrative domain that so much thinking about strangers took place in our cities. Strangers took the law seriously too, for it ensured their safety and defined their prospects. Nowhere was this more evident than in the lives of non-Christian strangers in Europe. Reflecting on diversity in cities, I've also found it useful to think of urban centers as a sort of assemblages, uh, a term first coined in French, actually, I don't know how it got to be called assemblages in English, because it's actually agencement, which, like most terms, sounds great in French. Seeing the city as an assemblage is taking it to be made of many parts, human, material, animal, combined to form a whole for a while with its forms of behavior, objects, and emotions too. Historians have, over recent years, tried to understand cities through distinctive patterns of identity, particularly historians who deal with religion, this idea of civic religion. 
We might do so too, but only in a weak sense. Cities might meet at great processional moments or in the public rituals of religious life, but those moments of hope and joy were followed by the hard work of living together day by day in neighborhoods, homes to diversity. So cities emerged as processes, never fixed, and they were divided spaces in so many ways. Within their spaces, which were carefully planned and measured, as Keith Lilly of, of Queens has taught us so well, Habits and routines unfolded in time and space, bells and curfews, market days and festivals. But the urban space was also dramatically divided, separated into zones by political barriers. Many cities were in fact actual clusters of different sort of town paths. Uh, two in Manosque, two in Marseille, five in Braunschweig. In Metz there were three sections, each controlled by a different clan. Cities had precincts of cathedrals in their midst with their own jurisdictions and building styles and sociability. The city was of parts in fundamental ways. An important intervention by Patrick Lanschner presses us to keep in mind the polycentric, as he calls it, nature of urban politics, however constituted, and he does so through a sustained analysis of a number of cities in the Low Countries and Italy. Cities were faction and competition. No city is ever at rest, at peace with itself. Every city was assembled process responding to a combination of challenges with the tools, material and conceptual, that were its history, that were its legacy, diversity, both as a challenge and as a tool. A term often associated with thinking about migration and strangers is cosmopolitanism a concept which animated a recent year-long seminar here at Queen's led by Stephen Kelly. It imagines a world of interconnected and evenly spread sociability and concern based on arguments which have been explored quite frankly since uh, classical antiquity and very vigorously since the uh, European Enlightenment. Some Mediterranean ports might be examples of cosmopolitan centers. Uh, some of them go back to Greek, Greek antiquity, like Ancona or, or, or Alexandria. Uh, in Northern Europe, we might even note uh, that area of diversity which developed uh, uh, amongst the uh, cities and towns of the Hanseatic network. This association of trading towns around uh, the northern Baltic seas and along the rivers that fed from them encourage a certain ease of movement and familiarity. Cosmopolitanism is associated with cultures of movement and exchange with il which illuminate uh, some of our cities too. It is useful in thinking of the commercial world explored, for example, by the late and much, much missed Remy Constable in her study of the Mediterranean system of hospitality of the Funduk, which in fact Venice learned from uh, in the early 13th century when it thought of providing for its northern merchants. Universities are another milieu which is often spoken of as cosmopolitan, a world of work and sociability and enabled by shared language and pedagogy, career prospects and ritual formation of its members, a world vastly expanded with the creation of, in the 15th century, 50 new universities. Through comparison and juxtaposition we will discern differences but also identify patterns in attitudes to strangers in cities. This is why I've chosen to offer not a handful of local studies, though certain communities you will see uh, where I've dug in the archives will appear rather prominently, nor will these lectures offer colourful biographies of people who fashion shape-shifting lives in cities, men like the three aliens recently studied so well by Sanjay Subramanya. Rather, I shall observe comparatively how in different parts of Europe strangers were treated in law and social practice. In these Wiles lectures, we will find that the acceptance of newcomers exhibited in periods of growth was followed by curtailment and even expulsions of groups from cities, as well as by more constraining procedures regarding newcomers. Economic downturn was evident in Western Europe already in the early 1300s, and in the terrible years of famine, 1315 to 22, it seemed never to stop raining in Northern Europe. Cities experienced the desperation of hungry people, their own as well as refugees, and the dizzying volatility of prices and debt spirals. 
Europe's cities were truly then devastated, and I mean the word literally, laid waste by the great mortality of 1347 to 52, which hit urban centers particularly hard and continued to do so over the following decades and into the 15th century. This economic downturn, which Bruce Campbell has rightly called the Great Transition, well, rightly to my mind, created in cities a range of political alignments often associated with the desire of workers to assert themselves since labor was scarce and skills much in demand. The new order unsettled communities where mercantile elites were hard pressed and frankly confused and workers often insistent and effectively organized. We will see, especially in Southern Europe, these cities these troubled public spaces handed over to charismatic preachers who preached and lobbied for programs of root and branch reform that sought to control everything from the marriage bed to, base, to, to business ethics, hence the very composition of urban communities. The city lived under the burden of the imaginations of rulers and artists and poets and architects. At the beginning of our periods, towns were usually depicted by a bit of wall and sometimes some identifying building, always at work, always at work, like there in the Life of Saint-Denis, a glorious manuscript that was handed to the King of France in 1317 by the monks of Saint-Denis, who were in fact his court intellectuals. And you see even just here, not only the Pont Neuf there, but um, ferrying and bringing and entering the city work, delivery. But by the late end of our period, we will find that cities are imagined differently. They tend to be organized as landscapes from a sole vantage point, set in an environment, and of course, obeying the new rules of perspective, perspective and the conventions of map making. The city as panorama. <coughs> This coincided with the coming of print and the making accessible to wide publics now of new combinations of word and image aimed to boost a city's reputation. When the world history bestseller, the Nuremberg Chronicles, from which this image is taken, was published in the late 15th century, it included 2,000 images like that of cities. Cities were where history was made. So over the next three lectures, and I so hope many of you will return to hear them, we will consider diversity and strangeness in the cities in the following manner. Lecture two tomorrow will be, we'll talk cities of strangers, of the rules for reception and control. On Friday, we will talk about cities of women, women, the strangers within. And in lecture four on Saturday, mid, uh, I think late morning, uh, cities of God taking the end case of strangeness the non-Christian, the strangers, strangers of all. Now, Mrs. Antonia Boyd, our founder, devised a unique and rather terrifying format for the Wiles Lectures. Her provision has allowed us to invite seven distinguished scholars to Belfast, and they will animate discussion after every lecture, after every dinner, after every lecture. And they're also available for you to meet, and I'm sure they would be, once you've heard their names and see what they look like, you will be able to contact them and ask them because they are very interesting people. So I'm going to introduce them to you for that purpose in alphabetical order. So there's Mark Bona of the University of Ghent, who is simply the leading historian of the Low Countries. It's the cautious urban urbanization, its rich cultures of commerce, and its contributions particularly to the making of European statehood. And there's Emma Dillon, professor of music at King's College London, who has written imaginatively on the sounds of cities, on music and religious chant, on the cries of the market vendors and the hubbub of sociability. Serena Ferrente is reader in history at King's College London, an expert on the thinking which underlay political lives of cities fostered by traditions of law, rhetoric and religion to make Italian, the, the, Italian political culture and Italian political classes classes. Tomorrow we'll be joined by Therese de Hemptin from the University of Ghent and the Belgian Royal Historical Commission and she will offer us terrific expertise on the lives of women in cities and on the culture of scribal labor so central to urban life. Kate Jansen will arrive tomorrow again as well of Catholic University of America in Washington DC who 
has just completed a wonderful book, it's not out yet unfortunately, on how Italian townspeople made peace after periods of bloody feud and vendetta. Something worth knowing. Gabor Klonitsai of the Central European um, University in Budapest, a university with which we feel utter, utter solidarity as it's being attacked by the, the forces of darkness. He has studied the formation of Central European religious cultures through their cults of saints, but also through the persecution of suspects of heresy and witchcraft. And Daniel Smale, professor of medieval history at Harvard, knows the cities of the southern Mediterranean better than anyone, the workings of their law courts, the material goods they made and pawned and cherished. I'm so grateful to all of you for dedicating these spring evenings to the Wiles Lectures. Thank you.